Hello to all of you. Uh, we're getting started here with our webinar. I'd like to thank you for joining us for Make Your Own Makerspaces. I am Janet Nelson, the Director of Library Engagement and Solutions for DEMCO, and I'm moderating this session. At DEMCO, we're always interested in how to better serve the needs of our customers, and these webinars have been a great way for us to connect and provide additional information around important topics for evolving libraries. Today's presentation is going to walk you through some basic principles that can help you evaluate how a makerspace might fit into the plans for your library and how you might get started if you find that this is something that, that you're looking for. I'm pleased to introduce you to Carson Black, who will be our speaker. Carson is a technology consultant who has experience working with libraries across the country and is based in Colorado. He got his start in libraries as a media service supervisor at Loveland Public Library in Colorado. Since then, Carson has led, managed, and supported library technology efforts for more than 17 years. He's been called a geek who speaks English and enjoys acting as a bridge between the world of librarians and hardcore technologists. He has a passion to demystify technology for the uninitiated and to help IT professionals understand and support the goals of libraries. As a consultant, Carson is often brought in to help solve complex institutional issues and to help align the library's public service mission with its technology efforts to serve the needs of patrons and staff. Carson participates in numerous committees through ALA and advocates for libraries through activities such as facilitating a group of librarians, archivists, and museum workers at the South by Southwest Conference. Our hope is that by the end of this session, you'll have some practical tips to allow you to be more confident in deciding whether a makerspace makes sense for your library and what resources you might need. So with that, Carson, we are going to put the controls in your hands and you can get started when you're ready. That sounds so good. Janet, thank you so much for such a, a great introduction. Um, and I'm really, really excited about our uh, presentation today because this is such a hot topic. A lot of, a lot of folks are um, wondering what a makerspace is and you know, what, it, what they can do with it and why they should care, things like that. And so we are going to dive right into that. I'm going to make sure that my slide is showing up correctly. Um, uh, in the home office, can you, can you see that slide, that first slide? Um, I can see your background right now. You can see my background. OK. Uh, let's try this. Let's see if this is showing There's up. There's the slide. Fan fantastic. It's always, it's always good to start off on the, on the right foot. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have begun. And uh, let's make our own makerspace together. Our learning objectives today is, of course, we want to learn what makerspaces are. We want to kind of get on the same page, um, uh, have the same definition, same idea of what a makerspace is. Uh, through that process, develop an understanding around the different types of makerspaces. There's more than one. It's a lot of ways to look at this uh, concept. We want to learn about the space part. That's half of the word, after all. So we want to learn about the space needs for makerspaces. We want to understand the role of partners as well. I think you'll find that uh, partnerships are extremely important to successful makerspaces. And of course, uh, my, my desire or my hope is that you become inspired to create a makerspace all your own. Now, uh, we have a Twitter hashtag to contribute questions uh, to the presentation today. Um, uh, you were uh, told about that a little bit earlier in the, the pre-introduction, but just in case you need to see it again, uh, it's up on the screen. I would also love to uh, hear from you. That is my Twitter handle. It's uh, simple, Carson Block, at Carson Block. And I uh, would love to, to hear your comments or, or questions uh, as you listen to the presentation. Now, this is um, a, a, a common uh, thought, I think, that uh, people think when you're a technologist such as I am, uh, that uh, it's all about the technology. Well, I have to tell you that my, I don't own this t-shirt. Uh, this t-shirt that you see, easily distracted by shiny objects. Um, I am really, really about uh, the effectiveness of technology in helping us achieve our missions, whatever that is, but really, really getting in touch uh, with the things that make a difference in our communities, the things that, that, our, that our libraries are meant and intended to fulfill. And uh, that's actually the beginning of uh, just making great technology uh, choices. Uh, it's not that I don't uh, love technology, I do, and I, I think that it's a, it's a great thing to be in service uh, to things that we want to accomplish. But the first thing is really understanding our 
the, the, the need that we have and the way that we want to approach it. And then we look for the solution to that. Uh, technology is often one tool to help realize our dreams. So I, uh, I want you to know that I, even though I believe in maker spaces and I think that they are extremely important to libraries as we move forward, uh, they're not the right thing for everyone, uh, but they might be for you. And that's why I'm glad you're here. This is something that uh, we can explore together uh, in this hour. Now, uh, your makerspace should meet a need in your community. I'm on my soapbox right now about that. Um, uh, that takes a little uh, ex exploration, takes a little bit of uh, thinking about, uh, and also talking, lots of conversations, uh, whether your community is uh, within the school group, um, uh, locally, within uh, the, 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 the curriculum that you're teaching. Uh, within the local public library mission, the sorts of audiences that you serve, that is really, really important. And yes, I am on my soapbox, just like that guy in that picture right there. Um, I uh, believe in this, that the great, great choices start uh, from that core. So I can't underscore that anymore. Uh, so we'll move along and we will define what a makerspace is and explore why makerspaces are important to libraries. This is uh, really about the, the concept of the library as a place of creation and not just a place of consumption. For many, many years, the library has been thought of as a place, a storehouse of information and ideas, a place where people come to uh, come and grab it and take it away with them. Um, the concept of the makerspace kind of turns that on its head and says not, not only do we allow people to take things from us to enrich their lives and, and uh, to uh, become more educated, but we also are now a place for people to create uh, that very sort of knowledge and that very uh, source of information. It's very, very, very exciting. When we think of maker spaces, uh, these are some of the common elements. These are the things, the threads that I see anyway between um, places that we're defining as maker spaces in, in libraries. Uh, first and foremost, it's a place to gather with others. It's a physical place, a physical experience where we're in the presence of other people. It's also a place to make things with our hands. I think as our uh, society becomes increasingly virtual, increasingly online, I think we, uh, we have this desire to stay in touch with uh, things that, that we can touch and feel, uh, not just think about, not just see with our eyes, but also touch and feel uh, and to create. It's also a place to share ideas. That's a, that's a huge uh, uh, part of this collaboration that happens in the makerspace. The interactivity um, is very, very important. Uh, if you've ever uh, been with other people, <laughs> which I'm sure you have, um, some of those, uh, uh, those times when we're involved in activity have really sparked excellent ideas, and ideas build upon each other. It's just part of our oral tradition as, as people. And it's extremely powerful. And of course, there, there are more. There are other uh, elements of maker spaces. You may come up with uh, some on your own, or you may have observed some uh, as well. The user experience is really, really what I'm talking about. And I wanted to share something really, really fun. Uh, earlier this week, I was in Frisco, Texas. And in, in Frisco, we were doing a, um, a session to create uh, their makerspace, to come up with the vision for the makerspace and uh, come up with the, the impacts that they wish to achieve in their community and uh, also the tangible plan, <laughs> the, uh, the actual roadmap to get from uh, the point of origin, the, the idea and the inspiration all the way to delivering it. So that was a session that we worked on. Uh, but part of the, the process is we built a couple of things together and it was really, really fun. We, we created our own little makerspace as a way to warm up to the idea of makerspaces and really start thinking about what this meant. And uh, what we had is we had um, a couple of uh, projects uh, that we were working on <laughs> and it was so much fun. Um, uh, we had a couple of different teams, a couple of different projects and immediately after the session, I asked people how they felt when they made something together. And these are the results. There was a sense of fun, there was a sense of excitement, accomplishment, a sense of community and healthy competitiveness. We had two different uh, uh, sort of platforms that we were working on and some people preferred one over the other and constantly compared the superiority of their chosen platform to the others. All in good fun. It was, it was uh, all for, for fun uh, in the process of building, and it was great uh, because there really was a sense of collaboration, especially within the different teams that were working on uh, their projects. There was this intense interactivity. 
um, this opportunity to seek help and to also share help. Um, and we have this, uh, we were using wires uh, for part of this, electric wires, and uh, the wire cutters that I brought were a little bit too big for these uh, tiny wires that, that we needed to cut. And so a member of the group had to show other members of the group how to actually use that, that tool, that the tool that was imperfect, and use it in a way that was perfect for the, the, the use. It took, it took that seeking and sharing of help being very powerful. There's also a real thrill of embracing risk. And of course, at the end, this celebration of accomplishments. Now, when I asked people how they felt after that session, uh, you might have been involved in um, you know, a focus group before we were coming up with a list like this. These things just spilled out of people's mouths. It was uh, so quick. People knew exactly how they felt. And they were so energized uh, from this. And so this is something to remember as a, as a learning tool. Um, uh, when when uh, people's minds are open and they're they're energized in this way, they're really really focused on uh, accomplishing and soaking up things. And I think that that is a really powerful part of the maker um, uh, thing, the whole maker um, experience. Uh, that uh, is uh, something that we can provide. The first library maker space, and I say first in quotes, uh, you'll know why in just a little bit, because uh, there's a lot of ways to define a maker space. But the first one that's identified as such um, uh, was the Fayetteville Fab Lab, Fayetteville Free Library in New York. It uh, came from an idea of a grad student. Or in Britain, she had, uh, was keeping track of some things happening in society and noticing that there was this, this maker movement uh, happening. And she pitched the idea uh, to the library director, Sue Considine. And <laughs> Sue hired her and said, come make it happen here. So uh, recognized as the, as the first public library maker space in Syracuse, New York, um, it's, uh, it's still a very, very robust place. It's still in a, a super operation. There's three areas and functions that they are focusing on. Uh, for, for their efforts. One is a creation lab, and the idea here is digital content creation. That's creating audio and video files. Um, and the other is the Fab Lab. In this case, the Fab Lab stands for Fabulous Laboratory. Uh, not fabrication, but fabulous laboratory, even though the, the idea is that it is the creation of physical objects. And there's also Little Makers. Little Makers is a free play area for kids. Uh, to imagine, create, and build. And through that, they have links to STEM curriculum. That's the science, technology, engineering, and math aspects um, uh, from uh, the Little Makers area. So they really, really had a chance to get this idea out there. It's, uh, they've got a lot of recognition for their good work, and it just continues to, to grow. Uh, now, one thing I would say is that uh, the Fab Lab has this association, as do many library maker spaces. That's the idea that uh, it's uh, there with something that's in a real high-tech sort of thing. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever seen a 3D printer, but essentially it's just, just what it says. It's a, it's a device that uses a plastic, in most cases, to print, uh, but it prints in three dimensions. So it does one layer, and then the printing head comes back and does another layer, and then another layer, and another layer. And next thing you know, it, it starts to build these 3D objects that you see here from the ground up. Now, this has um, uh, been uh, an area of criticism as well, because you can take a look. There's a, there's a blue bunny there, and uh, there's a uh, yellow horse. There's um, uh, looks like chess pieces as well uh, that, that are made in that picture. And so the question of folks who are critical of this, especially in a library environment, um, uh, say, so, <laughs> we're making tchotchkes? What's the big deal? Why is this important at a library? Well, I think that the biggest problem here is uh, a marketing problem. I think that if um, uh, those who make 3D printers and brought them into libraries, if they would have started with something like this, a 3D printer that makes chocolate, we would, we would see, it would be a foregone conclusion. Of course we have a 3D printer that makes chocolate, or that uses chocolate. Um, and we have one in every break room in every library across the country. Um, that's, uh, I, I just like this, I think it's funny. But um, I actually, when, when I first saw the, the use of 3D printing, I asked myself, what is, what is this role? Because again, I don't, I don't own that t-shirt that says, you know, easily distracted by shiny objects. So my question was, what, what relevance, what role does this have 
um, in a library, and then I started seeing some things that really, really brought it home for me. Now, this is this is one that's amazing. Um, this is uh, uh, one kid helping another kid. Uh, Mason Wild is 16. The other kid is a nine-year-old named Matthew. Um, they live in the Kansas City, Kansas area. They go to the Johnson County Public Library, and Mason printed, 3D printed, fabricated a prosthetic uh, hand for Matthew. Uh, he did this by uh, finding a digital file of a, of a hand that would operate, uh, I think it was in Australia is where he found it. He uh, uh, was able to take this digital file and manipulate it so that he could scale it down, make it smaller uh, to, fit, uh, uh, to fit Matthew's hand. And he created uh, a, a hand using the 3D printer at the library that has uh, changed this kid's life. Um, I, I encourage you to check, uh, click on the, the link uh, or to follow that link uh, when, you, when you see the slides. These slides will be available after the, the presentation. We won't be playing this YouTube video, but it's certainly worth a look to see uh, just the relationship between these two and, and the fact that one kid is using um, uh, the public library to do something life-changing for another kid. I think that that's amazing. Uh, it's, it's a story, I think, that speaks to the heart. It certainly speaks to my heart. I look at that, and I think that's, that, is, uh, that is so powerful, and it's really evident what's going on. Uh, but I also kind of am a holistic <laughs> sort of guy. So I also want to speak to the head. And, and actually, um, this was the first time when I saw this article in The Economist magazine. It was actually a, a section, a special section about a year ago. This is when I really started thinking that this is a powerful, powerful thing happening in libraries. And this is the prediction that small-scale manufacturing, desktop manufacturing, will be the next industrial revolution. Now, of course, the first industrial revolution uh, is considered to be textiles. That was in Great Britain in the late 18th century. The second, mass manufacturing, that's the, uh, that's the automobile line, the assembly line. Um, uh, you know, from parts to slapping them on and, and building things, and that's, uh, we do a lot of that, of course, today in so many levels. But the third that's predicted is this idea of small-scale desktop manufacturing uh, brought because we have this incredible opportunity to converge powerful software, new materials, new processes like 3D printing, and the growth of web-based services. The, the web is helping us move this data around and access it and share it, and it's uh, it's been, become incredibly, incredibly powerful. And small-scale manufacturing is not tchotchkes. Uh, this is an example that you may have seen yourself already. Uh, if you haven't, I think you soon will. And I, I don't want anyone. I, you know, I, I'd like to say, how many people have ever got a crown? That, that's not a, a dental example. <laughs> it's not always uh, the best to use, but it's incredible what's happening with dental crowns. If you've ever gone through the process. Uh, the uh, predominant process um, that, that's been in place for a long time is that the dentist uses, uses a material to take a mold of your tooth, and then that mold is then sent to a lab. The lab creates a crown uh, in the lab and then sends it back to the dentist, and the dentist tries to fit it. Now, sometimes, uh, and, and dentists usually have to do a little adjusting to those, sometimes they fit, sometimes they don't, and they need to be sent back to the lab and, and further refined. Well, the idea of the in-office dental crown is that the uh, dentist is able to take a digital scan of, of your tooth, of your jaw, and all the associated parts, and can use this machine, which um, it uses a blank, and it kind of whittles away the correct tooth dimensions to fit your tooth. They can do that all in the office in a relatively short amount of time. I think that something like this is extremely revolutionary, especially when you think of uh, the idea of uh, rural areas. Um, in a rural area uh, all over the world, um, uh, but especially here in the, in the United States, it, it can take a long time to do something like uh, get a crown back from the lab. And if it doesn't work right, that's, that's just a lot of time, a lot of uh, effort that's being exp uh, spent. Um, imagine the difference that this can make. Uh, and, and this is something that's available today. It's not a future thing. Uh, this is something that my own dentist office has. Uh, he's had it for a couple of years now, and I'm just extremely impressed with that. So after seeing those things, I've got a pop quiz for you. We're not asking you to participate um, online. You can just, uh, you can just uh, have the answer to yourself, 
and shout it out. <laughs> we'll hear you. Uh, which of these can be considered a makerspace? Is it A, an area with 3D printers, computers, laser cutters, and other fun toys? Is it a sewing or a knitting circle? Is it an empty room with reconfigurable space? Or is it all of the above, A, B, C, or D? Well, I think most people <laughs> have already selected D. I think by, no, by now that you realize that uh, makerspaces are low-tech, high-tech, and all points in between. They really uh, run the, the, the uh, gamut of, of use because it's really not about the stuff. It's about um, what we are accomplishing together, uh, working with our hands, working in communities. An example that I wanted to share of a low-tech space, we talked about the knitting circle or the sewing circle, uh, but I thought this was a beautiful example of uh, ikebana. This is the Japanese uh, art of flower arranging. And that's something that's done in a community. It's done in a, in a group. Um, it's a group effort and uh, it's just a beautiful process of you know, arranging flowers in this just aesthetically beautiful way. And uh, this uh, woodblock print is from 1854. And of course, things that existed long before that. But, but uh, the idea that I want to give you is that this idea of getting together um, in this way is not new to, to share ideas, share information, uh, and work with our hands in community. Now, of course, there are high-tech ways of doing this uh, at the same time. Um, uh, maker spaces, including in libraries, sometimes have things like this. This is a laser cutter. And I don't know if you've ever seen one um, do its thing, but it's awesome. <laughs> it's really, really, it's really, really fun uh, because it's so precise and it's, you know, it uses light, to, this intense light, uh, to cut uh, shapes out of materials. Uh, and it's just a kind of a, a fun thing to watch. But high tech is certainly um, a, a way to define uh, a makerspace. There's also this concept of using audio, visual, or, or having a place for audio and visual creation, audio, video uh, sorts of content. We, as we increasingly again become digital, um, we are communicating with each other, not just uh, over the phone or via text or chat or uh, using email. We're also using media, creating media to communicate to each other. And so this is a, uh, this is a great example. Tacoma Public Library Story Lab um, is, uh, They've just done a great job of uh, engaging the community for people telling their stories. Every time I pop my head in there uh, in Tacoma, uh, this room is busy. There are, uh, it looks just like this. Now, this room is not huge. It's basically about the size of a couple of meeting rooms put together, but they uh, treated the walls. Uh, they, um, uh, part of great video, of course, is good audio, so that you can hear things really, really well. Uh, that's going on. It's um, uh, just an amazing space, but this idea of AV creation uh, as a makerspace is huge. Now, I would also say uh, something I consider a makerspace are co-working and business spaces. Uh, co-working is making economic development <laughs> and fostering that in your community. Um, today, I'm actually broadcasting from a co-working space. My uh, my permanent office is, is part of a co-working space, and a a co-working space uh, has opportunities for people to just drop in and uh, use a desk for an hour or a day or months or years, uh, depending on what they want to do. Or, or like myself, just have, a, have an office space uh, that's here. It's a lot of independent folks who uh, find that it's valuable to have this opportunity to see each other, to talk, uh, to share our expertise. Um, none of us uh, at my co-working space do exactly the same thing. But we all have something uh, in common in the fact that we're, we're, we're kind of solo acts. And it's so important to be able to have other people to talk to and learn from and also to teach. It's just been a remarkable experience. And um, uh, libraries are also uh, making that available based, of course, on the needs in their community. So I think that um, these, are, these are a start of some of the, the primary ways that makerspaces are expressed. But really, the next makerspace is defined by you. What does your community need? What impacts can you help deliver? And what is your vision? Uh, a conversation around those three things should, should be the most important part of your discussion when it comes to makerspaces. So not the, the gear, not the high tech or low tech, but really thinking what need is it that we have here? And is a makerspace the, the appropriate way to, to, to address that if it is? then you can start um, having 
the fun with the toys and the uh, the layout and the furnishings and all that that stuff. That's all really really important, but it really starts with this vision, impacts, and needs uh, that you can help address. Now, for a moment, we're going to talk about the maker movement. Just to give you some context, you may have heard it referred to in this way. The uh, the maker movement. There's a lot of people making things, and the word make, of course, is become a household word thanks to uh, to this magazine. Um, make Magazine is uh, a really kind of been a focal point for folks involved in the maker movement. Now, there's a lot of places that, that makers gather, but this one is really, really visible. You see this on the newsstand. It's really, really popular. It's getting more popular. Um, again, this is the idea of making stuff. And you can see the, the joy on everyone's face <laughs> in, those, in those photos. I mean, it's like, wow, look what I did. Check it out. The rocket's taking off, you know. And uh, the, the, we, when I described the focus group uh, that we had in Frisco, um, those were the same things that were done uh, there. What's really cool about this magazine is it uh, doesn't, it's not, doesn't come out too often, but it comes out um, a number of times in the year. And there's no advertising in it. It's all about... Um, uh, you know, different projects. Some of them are high tech, some of them are low tech, some of them require you to buy things, some of them can be done for free, um, but uh, they're all, it's kind of a little instructional thing. Uh, a big phenomenon, but it's also not a brand new one. I think, uh, I love uh, these, the, 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 the images that I was able to get here. Uh, Popular Electronics, the first issue, October 1954. That uh, looks like my workbench at, at home. I'm a guitar player. I love tube, uh, vacuum tube guitar amps, you know, very old guitar amps. Those are still uh, the, the predominantly popular amplifier for, for electric guitar players. And uh, you fix them just like that. <laughs> you tear them apart and you use an ohm meter and, and you click around there and, and you do your best not to get electrocuted. Uh, at the same time, uh, fast forwarding a little bit into, into something a little bit more high tech for the time, uh, 1975 Popular Electronics uh, featured how to make the Altair uh, computer, the Altair 8800. That was a big deal back then. Uh, that's actually, when you look at it, that's a pretty small computer for, uh, for that, that day and age and um, certainly uh, reflects uh, what has just grown from there in the in the maker movement. Also, Heathkit. I don't know how many people remember Heathkit, but Heathkit was a just a super cool uh, audio sort of hobbyist thing, and the Heathkit stuff was really really good. So uh, there were kits available to build speakers, to build uh, hi-fi amplifiers, and they all sound awesome. Uh, so uh, if you ever see Heathkit uh, strapped onto something at a garage sale, you might want to take a look at it because it's pretty pretty. Cool. So with that, even though I said I don't have that t-shirt, easily distracted by shiny objects, um, it is important to kind of know what sorts of options there are out there. And I want to make sure that everyone, uh, you've probably heard makerspaces associated with different sorts of um, uh, electronic tools. Well, we're going to look at some of those right now so that you have uh, some sense, some idea of what's available and what it does. Uh, this is a, 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 a huge platform, Arduino. It's open source. It's for electronics prototyping. Uh, it's for artists, designers, hobbyists, and others who want to create interactive objects uh, or environments. And it has lots and lots of modules. And they've got these controller capabilities. So the, the modules have environmental sensors. They can sense heat and cold and light and sound. Um, and they can control other things like other modules or other computers um, uh, or other devices in the environment. So those have been extremely popular as a, as a, uh, as a kit to build, and, and they're just really super fun. Uh, Raspberry Pi are, uh, is actually a little computer, if you can believe that. That is a, a little tiny, a full-featured computer. It, uh, it runs an operating system that, that doesn't take up lots and lots of resources, so they're able to do a lot with that little thing. You can see from the connectors that it supports an awful lot of connectivity to the environment. And so there's USB, there's, uh, there's mini SD slot for uh, storage, uh, for compact uh, uh, data storage, US, uh, I said, uh, yeah, USB network, 
uh, video, audio, it's really, really full featured and it really helps people learn programming as well. I love what they call their maker events. They call them Raspberry Jam, which uh, sounds pretty awesome. Uh, they can be used for, uh, or one library I know of, uh, Douglas County Libraries in Colorado is actually using ra Raspberry Pi as a way to create their own door counters uh, at a very low cost and a really effective way to, uh, to spread them out. So there's a lot of uh, uses for a little baby computer that you can basically just stick just about anywhere. Another fun thing is called Little Bits, and this is brand new, uh, what we're seeing here. Now, now, Little Bits are basically little circuit boards. You can uh, see in the upper right-hand corner. I know it's kind of hard to see, but the different color bands means that each one of those is a different little segment that can be assembled together to create a circuit of some sort. Well, uh, NASA uh, apparently thinks Little Bits is pretty cool because just this week they released a kit that allows um, some, uh, you know, a lot of things based on STEM, uh, but uh, designed to help uh, uh, learn more about scientific principles like electromagnetism, <laughs> kinetic stuff, and potential energy. So you can make a Mars rover with these kits or something like the International Space Station. Now that's pretty cool, and it's brand new, just totally hot off the press. So. Um, uh, take a look at, at that. Uh, there are companies, of course, that put all these things together for us, which is kind of uh, great uh, to have. Uh, SparkFun is one such company uh, that has a lot of these different tools uh, for browsing, and they also have other things like interfaces to connect these uh, electronic things to your smartphone so that you can use it to talk to the Internet or talk to your phone or talk to an app or have an app talk to it. It's, uh, it, it's really, really, really uh, Awesome. And this is leading us to a phenomenon, that, another thing that I think we should become fluent with, just as uh, the, if the idea of uh, desktop uh, manufacturing, uh, libraries becoming fluent with that being a good idea, which I, I think it is. If it's true that we are entering this age of desktop manufacturing um, in, and uh, we want our communities, our students, and our patrons to start becoming aware of how this new world works. Um, uh, in the same way, uh, these kits, I think, serve the purpose of helping us understand the Internet of Things. I don't know if you've heard of that phrase before, but essentially it's something that's here right now, and that's embedded uh, network connectivity and controls within things in our environment. And so uh, right now, this is, a, this is a picture of things that are available right now in a house where you can use an, an app. Uh, that's connected to your HVAC uh, controls, your environmental controls, heat and cooling, um, uh, different power switches, security and alarms, motion sensors. These are all things that you can actually control from your smartphone because each one of those devices is uh, Wi-Fi enabled and it is able to connect to the Internet to create that, that connection. So this is the, the physical and the electronic world bridging. And so that's what I love the most about those, uh, those kits that we looked at is that they, uh, they kind of get under the hood and give us a sense of how that stuff works. And a lot of people are, are really, really um, responding to that as well in maker spaces. Another way to um, approach or another function that can happen in a maker space is um, hacking, computer hacking. And one of the easiest, most accessible ways is through Scratch. And this is a free programming language uh, from the fine folks at MIT. And it also has an online community um, uh, for people to share ideas uh, and stories and interactive games and, and animations. Now, uh, this picture that you see here is kind of a cool little program. It's got a little moon background. And that little yellow being, the game is played, that's such a, it, it appears for a few moments. And you try to click on it with your mouse and, and before it disappears, and it'll just show up anywhere, just kind of like whack-a-mole. <laughs> uh, it's a fun little game that was actually built on another game. So one user took a, a different game, and they built their own game on top of it. And so through this way, it's a, it's a way for uh, anyone, uh, it's aimed at kids of course, but really anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about programming can get started uh, with something like Scratch. And then of course there is, again, what we think of a lot, 3D printing, uh, such as uh, typified um, by MakerBot. You can see some of the things uh, in, in one of their more modern uh, machines. This is the Replicator 2, and this is the concept of desktop fabrication. Now there's two primary types of desktop uh, fabrication. There's additive, there's subtractive, and then when you put the two together you have a combination of, 
of uh, desktop manufacturing. So we, a lot of times we'll generically say 3D, pr uh, 3D printing, um, but uh, there's also uh, another way to do this. Now, of course, the additive is 3D printing. That's uh, starting uh, small and building up. It's actually, as it describes, it's printing one little layer at a time a physical object. Then there's the subtractive, and that's also known as machining. And uh, two examples of that we discussed a little bit earlier. That's the dental crown machine, the laser cutter, uh, and there's other forms of subtractive uh, uh, sort of uh, manufacturing. And then, of course, putting them all together is the, the next uh, logical step to make something more complex. And uh, this is an example of a place that has made that possible. Um, uh, Lulzbot is a uh, place that makes uh, what are called open source 3D printers. So that printer that you see there, you actually don't need to buy it from them. They have supplied the 3D models uh, so that you can make it yourself using another 3D printer and, <laughs> and a little, little bit of machining uh, for some of the metal parts. Uh, but certainly you would not even have to buy that from them. They're happy to just give away the plans to their own 3D printer. And that's uh, actually kind of a large format 3D, 3D printer. You can see it from the size of a cat and the size of a box there. It's a pretty big size. Uh, I don't think the company is worried about going out of business, of course, because they sell all the supplies that, uh, that we need to do 3D printing. They've got plastics, and of course they sell their printers, but they sell parts, and they've all got a lot of expertise and a, a nice online community. Um, but it's a different way of looking at um, intellectual uh, sort of things, intellectual property and copyright uh, certainly come into play when we're looking at the, the idea that, that these 3D objects start as a data file, and uh, that data file is, is shared in some way. This is one way that people find things to make. This is a website called Thingiverse, and it's from MakerBot, and there's some really, really cool things on uh, Thingiverse. Uh, Thingiverse is uh, how our, uh, our young friends in uh, Johnson County, Kansas, uh, came up and found the, uh, the, the, the hand, uh, the, the prototype or the, the initial file, digital file for that hand. Um, these are a couple of the things that are featured this month on Thingiverse. One is a, three, uh, is a ukulele, isn't that cool? A little musical instrument um, to make. Uh, another are intricate puzzles, 3D puzzles that fit together uh, um, in, in certain ways. And so you can see the intricacies or the potential of this idea of 3D uh, printing. I think it's uh, just, uh, just phenomenal. And uh, the idea that there's an online community to share these files with other people to make their own uh, gives you a sense of that distribution and the importance of the library as a place to not just access these files, but also see, if, uh, see what they're like uh, in three dimensions. So next we'll talk about the space needed for maker spaces, or how much space do I need? That's a, that's a common question when people are, are looking at this. Uh, they want to know exactly how much space do they need. So I'm going to answer your question with another question. How much space do you have? Uh, some uh, maker spaces are tiny, tiny, tiny. They've been done in, in little meeting rooms. Uh, others are huge, like the entire floor of a, of a, uh, of a library in a metropolitan area and all points in between. So there's really not a set size. It really kind of goes back to those um, uh, aspects, those things that you want to achieve. So here's some key space elements, things to think about uh, when you're looking about the space requirements for, uh, for your maker space. Number one, things should be flexible. So that means that the space itself and any of the furnishings that you use should be able to be uh, easily moved, easily reconfigured, uh, easily uh, not just moved but removed and added back uh, maybe at a future date. Uh, flexibility is the key. Easy access to power because we still need to plug lots of stuff in um, these days and I think we will for quite a while. Uh, that's a very, very important as is a good data network. Um, wireless is a great way to blanket uh, a maker space, even a big one. Uh, but uh, don't be too quick to discount wires either. There's things that we can do in a, in a wired environment that are not as easy to do or, or they're expensive to do in a wireless. So there's a, a pros and cons to, to both approaches. So you should try to have a, a mix of both wired and wireless uh, connectivity uh, in that area. Uh, the ability to reconfigure everything that you see is really, really important as well as, uh, remember, I'm on my soapbox, excellent vision and programming support. 
Now, another question comes up is, aren't these places noisy and messy? <laughs> well, yeah, they can be. Um, they can also be quiet and neat, depending, uh, you know, a, a sewing a knitting circle, pretty quiet, um, fairly neat, uh, but they're noisy and messy, uh, yes, uh, some of the things that we've looked at, um, but people are uh, as well. <laughs> And that's something that I want you to, to, to really think about is that this really is a place that's uh, designed to encourage interactivity, to encourage uh, community uh, people talking to each other. Uh, so we want to make sure that wherever we place this makerspace that, that we're encouraging that sort of activity. Partners are a very, very important part of every successful makerspace that I've seen. I think that, that partners and partnerships are what makes things uh, really, really tick and really be successful. Um, at one is the loneliest hashtag is my Twitter joke, uh, but something I, I believe too is that uh, trying to, to, to do this alone I think will be frustrating. Um, it's very, very powerful though to reach out to others and um, to uh, create a partnership either internally or externally, so internal to your library or institution or uh, within the community. So uh, another uh, question people ask is who should I partner with? And that's really dependent on uh, the sorts of things that you want to uh, accomplish. Um, one thing uh, that's really wonderful to look at is if you do have space issues, which a lot of people do, is uh, looking for uh, partners who have a space. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really, really cool thing um, and, and kind of a fundamental thing. I know some libraries can't uh, even get off the ground with a maker space because they simply don't have a place to do it. So um, finding or forming a partnership with someone that, that has space that can be used in a complementary way is really, really, uh, really important. There's a couple of key partnership elements, though, that to keep in mind, I think, um, that will really help you as you're forming partnerships. One is that you have a shared vision or a complementary vision. Um, it's really important that, 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 that you both have vision <laughs> to begin with. Um, a shared vision is really, really good, or, or having slightly different visions that really work well together is super important. Same thing goes for, for resources. Uh, either shared resources or, or resources that complement each other are, are uh, just very powerful elements in partnerships. Everyone should be solid and reliable, just good old human things, trustworthy and, and, and solid. Um, a lot of these things are, are dynamic in their nature. They're based around conversations, and uh, I think trust is really, really huge. Uh, the, the concept, though, is that all partners benefit equals a win. This should work for everybody involved, uh, not just thinking about what you can take, uh, but really what you can give uh, to your partner in this case can build some really, really powerful, powerful connections. So um, in the home stretch here of the presentation, we are going to look at some maker spaces that I hope give you some inspiration for your own. And I want to uh, carefully say this is by no means a sampling of every uh, makerspace, every awesome makerspace in, in, uh, in our library world is not represented here simply because there's too many. There are so many excellent makerspaces. So if your makerspace is not here, it's not because your space is not awesome <laughs> already. Uh, but I did pick the ones that were here based on uh, kind of the breadth and depth that they show of different possibilities. And I, I think these folks have done a great job. And, and I think even if you have a makerspace, you'll see something to be inspired by. One, of course, is uh, our uh, Fayetteville Free Library in New York. Uh, one of the things that I love about this, uh, about their uh, makerspace, is if you look at the, um, what they're using for furnishings, they're basically using card tables that they reconfigure as needed, and they're doing a great job. Uh, you can see on the right there's a, a vinyl cutter, cutter laptop, an Apple Macintosh computer, a 3D printer, another, another computer. Um, it's uh, there's sewing machines there in the the, uh, the place in the middle. There's tubs in the back. Um, this is a good space, and they're using tables that are easy to pick up and move and and collapse if they're not needed. Uh, and I think that's a great uh, takeaway uh, from looking at that. Chattanooga Public Library's fourth floor is uh, probably one of the more famous uh, public library maker spaces. Uh, that we have um, uh, right now. And there's a couple of things about uh, Chattanooga that, that I want to say. And first is kind of going back to this idea of, of, of 
partnership. Now, when we were talking about Fayetteville a Free Library before, I was talking about this incredibly powerful partnership between uh, the library director and, and a future staff member. There's something really similar uh, happening at Chattanooga. The, the director, Corinne Hill, and the assistant, Nate Hill, uh, they're not related uh, uh, in blood relatives, but they are super related when it comes to just being aligned uh, in their mission and the sorts of impacts that they want to have in the community. And uh, Chattanooga's uh, fourth floor is this huge space. It's more than 12,000 square feet. Um, they think about it as a public laboratory that's constantly in motion, it's constantly in beta. Um, there's an emphasis on uh, information design and tech and applied arts, and uh, they've, got, they've got the toys. They've got the 3D printers, a vinyl cutter, laser cutter, and related software. But I'm going to go back to that image for a moment. Um, you know, essentially what they did here is they, uh, I love this makerspace because they, they took all the junk that was in storage. They got rid of it. They polished the floor. They cleaned it up. They put uh, gigabit Ethernet, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Wi-Fi in there so that there's lots of great connectivity. And then they did what I think is, is really the, uh, the heart and soul of, of Chattanooga. It's not just this space, um, but I think Nate Hill, uh, my friend Nate, has uh, this deep talent, this real eye, uh, artist's eye um, in general. And so I, I think of this space as kind of a black box theater for, for making and for community involvement. But um, one of Nate's, uh, he has a lot of great skills, but I think one of his greatest skills is he's able to look and solicit really great partners to say, you know, you're doing something interesting, whether it's in Chattanooga or across the country, and say, why don't you come and do it here? We've got a venue for you to do the awesome things that you do. And I, I think that having that, that, that real artistic approach to, to cultivating community uh, it's one of the great strengths and a, and a great lesson from Chattanooga. Looking at uh, Westport Public Library in Connecticut, check out how they handle their space uh, issue. Uh, I don't know if they move stacks to put in that little uh, structure that you see in the middle of the, of the photo, but uh, I think that is, a, that is a great thing to do. It creates a sense of space, it's reconfigurable, and it makes a statement saying, this is where you come to make. Uh, they've gotten some great attention and great support from uh, INLS um, for, uh, for the next generation of their maker spaces. And uh, they also host a monthly maker in residence person, someone who's there to share, share their skills with uh, others coming. It's very, very cool, as well as uh, they're the host of their local mini maker fair. Of course, Chicago Public Library's U Media project is uh, the, the just the kind of the origin, I think, for the idea of the, of the teen spaces where uh, audio and video creation is taking place, and it just continues to be an incredible inspiration for uh, these sorts of maker spaces all over the country. Now, uh, when I visited Chicago about a year ago, I guess, year maybe a year and a half ago, the space was in its third iteration, its third redesign, and, and what I noticed is they were pushing people spaces forward, and that's what we're seeing here places for the, the, the kids to, um, uh, to hang out. And uh, there's also uh, tables uh, that you can't see there, uh, uh, working tables, study group tables that are just really filled. And, and they kind of pushed the technology to uh, corners, to, to, to places where it's more appropriate for people to work, but it's not front and center. And I, I thought that that's, uh, that was really telling to see uh, what they're doing, a great, great place to watch because they're always making that, that space fresh and making sure that it's meeting the needs in their community. Tacoma Public Library uh, is another place doing a great job with AV, but in a really small space. Again, they've, uh, they've got the right equipment, they've got uh, the rooms that are treated really well, and they've got a super engaged community using this, uh, the, the Story Lab uh, facility at the main library in downtown Tacoma. Like I said, every time I go, I see the place uh, is just uh, teeming with activity. It's just been so, so successful. But thinking about partnerships, the, um, uh, the, the first uh, external partnerships, the first folks I think about is Madison, Wisconsin, and a uh, public library, and a uh, maker community called Sector 67 in Madison. Uh, they have, uh, I think, really created a, uh, an excellent model for others to follow in the relationship between an external organization and a public library. And in fact, uh, while uh, Madison was remodeling its public library, Sector 67 um, uh, 
you know, having that, that, that place to do library sorts of activities in a maker environment and having the relationship uh, was extremely powerful and really made for great programming, uh, programming and connection with the community. Uh, Madison has remodeled and they actually now have their own makerspace called the Bubbler and it's devoted to creative projects including digital and physical uh, media. Now, um, I, sometimes, again, space can be an issue. How about a trailer? <laughs> well, this is what's happened with a place uh, called Tech Venture. There's a Tech Venture maker station. Fort Wayne, Indiana, Allen County Public Library has partnered with Tech Venture. And uh, essentially, uh, this is uh, the library provides a place for the, for the trailer to be parked. Uh, but otherwise, it's a self-contained environment for maker activities that's associated with the library, but really run by this uh, nonprofit, Tech Venture. Uh, that's a very innovative way, uh, I think, to um, provide for that space need. And uh, just to, from all accounts, it's just been a great, great partnership. Before, I was talking about how I think business development and co-working is a maker space. There's a great example in Washington, D.C. at the Washington, D.C. Public Library. It's the Digital Commons and Dream Lab. Um, they provide a lot of stuff that I, I just think is key these days in the public library. Job-specific skills, a computer training, assistance in finding jobs, and that idea of support for small and home-based businesses. Now, this is another super huge place. I think it's like 10,000 square feet. And I, I don't expect you to see that list that's on the left there. I know that the printing is very, very low, but for those getting the slides later, I want you to have access to it. The uh, Digital Commons uh, is doing something that I think is a, a, a amazingly revolutionary. They're not making people pick a platform um, that they don't like. So they've got uh, 16 iMac computers, they have 60 PCs, they have four iMac creative stations, they've got a, with, with Adobe Creative Suite software, a really expensive software package. They've got a 3D printer, a digital bar to test drive tablet computers, um, collaborative space, a Skype station, an espresso book machine to do print on demand, and seating with power outlets for 140 people. That is the way to do it. <laughs> Broward County, Florida uh, has a, a creation station area as well, and they've got something called the Tech Bar. Uh, the idea here is that there's a place to try things out. My, my friends at the Arapahoe uh, Library District, Ali Sanitas, uh, is doing, uh, uh, calls this showroom, the idea of having uh, folks come in and be able to try technology out that they've heard about or seen, but they, they don't own, maybe they don't want to own it, but they want to uh, understand what it's all about. And so this is uh, uh, a place, uh, and something that they also uh, support at uh, Broward County. And they've also, they're also doing uh, tons of incredibly great uh, makerspace uh, sorts of things at, at theirs, which they call the Creation Station. And then finally, Oak Park Public Library, uh, Illinois, has something called the Idea Box. And this is small creative exhibit space. This is kind of getting back to that idea of art and expressing um, ideas uh, through interactive uh, art and uh, exhibits. And people are encouraged, again, to learn through tinkering, fun, experimentation, and play. And I hope that you were inspired by those examples, and you're able to, to learn something new or pick up a couple of new tips during this webinar. And I also hope that you are the next to have a makerspace. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions? We do have some questions, Carson. First of all, thank you so much for, for all the great ideas. Um, we do have a lot of school libraries on the line today, and there's people that are wondering about whether this is appropriate to school libraries, because a lot of the examples that we showed today were public. But I just wanted to kind of interject that that School Library Journal has recently done a school text survey. And in that particular survey, 23% of the people indicated that they had makerspaces in their school libraries. And another 9% were planning to put in makerspaces. And a lot of them were in the area of robotics, electronics, web design, Minecraft, um, a lot of different things going on there as well. But uh, what other things might you have as suggestions for school libraries? I love that, that, uh, that question, that observation, especially that statistic, because when I think of, of, of schools, I think that they're already makerspaces. 
uh, <laughs> the whole, I, you know, in fact, I think that libraries have borrowed from that, uh, public libraries have borrowed from um, the, the hands-on sorts of things that have been happening in, in schools, especially with the, the, the young ages, and um, seeing the value and kind of taking that value out for a run, the idea that there's, uh, there's this benefit to the physical activity that really helps enrich learning. I think that, that maybe more can be done um, and maybe in some of the older grades uh, as, as we go forward. Um, I, I think sometimes uh, that can be lost and uh, perhaps the, um, the, the school library in uh, middle school, uh, junior highs, and high schools especially, uh, can uh, find uh, ways that maybe even are, are connected to paths, uh, higher educational paths uh, such as college and community college. Um, to just have another place to take some of these things out for a run, it's certainly through STEM, uh, but also through uh, trades as well. That's a great question. Um, that's great feedback too, Carson. And I think too in the school libraries, oftentimes some of that equipment may exist in other departments. That's just something to think about. It's not always uh, equipment that needs to be housed within the library. So, um, okay, a second question that we have here is, um, does the name always need to be makerspace? Sometimes there's connotations around that that, that maybe some people don't consider positive. And um, what other uh, suggestions might you have around a name for these types of spaces? <laughs> I, think, I think having a name other than makerspace is the best idea <laughs> ever. Um, because, simply because you know, when you look at the, the functions, as we talked about, it's so broad. It can be, you know, high tech or low tech. Um, uh, it, it certainly in makerspace is, is useful for us to talk about things like cloud computing is a is a useful term to talk about things, but it, it's not really specific sometimes or specific enough. And um, when we were in Frisco this week, we went through the, the process of uh, this very same question, and I uh, can't share with you this awesome name that they came up with for their makerspace. They'll they'll have that on the street uh, uh, soon. Um, but but certainly, you know, looking at a name that, that captures the spirit of what's being accomplished there uh, in some powerful way, I think is, is definitely better than using a generic term like makerspace. Um, that sounds great. I think extending the brand for the library and helping it define can really be a, a great way to approach that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay, another question that we have um, is around with the 3D digital printing and some of the files and the assets there, um, are there legal implications that need to be considered? There are. Uh, uh, in fact, this is such a, um, a powerful time, I think, to get involved with this because the same sorts of um, rules that apply to copyright, for instance, or intellectual property uh, are really being defined by the use of uh, 3D printing, for instance, and, and the fact that a digital file is containing the instructions to, to make an object. And I think becoming fluent and becoming um, aware of this by doing, by experiencing it, is really, really powerful. And I, and I do have to caution, too, it doesn't have to be a scary thing. Uh, I'm not suggesting that everybody go out and blaze trails <laughs> and, you know, try to figure out things in the, in the wild frontier when it comes to intellectual property with uh, this. A uh, place like Thingiverse uh, that we looked at, uh, that is a safe place for you know people sharing these files. These these files are shared by consent, and so there's not a there's not a danger or risk there. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think libraries uh, and librarians especially need to um, have an opinion on on these things and, and be helping our communities understand some of the implications around um, uh, intellectual property. Uh, again, as an extension of uh, copyright, copyright laws. So it's a, it's a fertile thing. We can you can get started without any risk or danger, um, but by being aware and, and, and sharing your information with others, I think would be a powerful way to use uh, a makerspace opportunity in your community for for dialogue and uh, just bringing us all up to speed. Thanks for the clarification on that. Um, we do. We have a lot of questions here, um, and I'll just remind everyone that we are going to get all of them answered, and they will be posted after after the event, um, along along with um, the other assets as far as the, this actual um, broadcast as well as the slides. But we'll take one last question here, and uh, this this 
uh, participant is noticing, um, they're feeling that maybe this seems like it's mostly around manufacturing and engineering. What are your thoughts on that? That is one of the perceptions, right, of, of a makerspace is that this is really about um, uh, the, the high-tech side or the hard side of, of making things. Um, but the, uh, a makerspace can be just about anything um, that gathers people together, gathers people together in community to make things with their hands, to, uh, to interact with each other. Uh, I, I think to, to, you know, build things with, with our hands, it doesn't, it, it's not just the, um, uh, the cool stuff, the flashy stuff. Um, when I use that example of the Ikebana, the, um, the, the Japanese art of flower arranging, I think that that typifies uh, the idea of making something just, that's just aesthetically beautiful. And the experience, I think, in building that, of people putting those, and I shouldn't use the word building, I should use the word creating to soften it up a little bit. Um, I think that, 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 that the experience, um, of that shared experience of that community making uh, something beautiful is just as, uh, as valuable and just as important as the result uh, of, the, of the, the beauty that was there. Because, you know, after, after a while, the, a cut flower fades away. But I think that the relationships that are built through uh, community, through, through making something together, accomplishing something together, is something that endures and just builds us as people and uh, builds our institutions and, and builds our communities. I think that's the real value, and that, that has nothing to do with uh, uh, the, uh, making something high-tech or machiney. Uh, it has everything to do about our relationships and, and our, our, our human needs that we have in our communities. Thank you, Carson. Um, I like the idea, too, that it really can be something for everyone. With that, we're going to wrap this up. Um, we'd like to thank Carson for sharing his insights and tips on how we can create exciting and engaging maker spaces. We hope that everyone was able to take away a few new ideas to try, and there was some great discussion, and we appreciate all of you sharing your time with us. We will be back on May 21st with a webinar titled Engaging Your Community with Facebook, being presented by Ben Bizzle. Feel free to register for this program and watch the DEMCO website for other new programs for additional 2014 offerings. We'll continue to send emails um, and post those things on our website so that you can find them. We hope you'll consider joining us for some of these future events. Again, so glad you joined us today and hope you have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.